Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Eric Toring. I'm the Senior Vice President for the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine. And I wanna welcome you to today's webinar. Uh, today's webinar is sponsored by the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine and its partner organizations, the American Association of Food Safety and Public Health Veterinarians, the National Association of Federal Veterinarians, and the U.S. Animal Health Association. I would like to turn things over to Dr. Kaylee Pettit, who is our representative from the ACVPM Continuing Education Committee. Thank you, Dr. Toring. Welcome, everyone. I'd like to also extend a very warm virtual welcome to today's speaker, Dr. Emily Fays. She is a three-time graduate of The Ohio State University. Prior to returning for her master's degree in the veterinary public health residency, she worked as a private practitioner in companion animal medicine for seven years. As previous director of the OSU CVM Antimicrobial Stewardship Program, Dr. Faze implemented the vision of the founding members of the ASP with the launch of a comprehensive veterinary stewardship program. Dr. Faze continues to work on projects focused on understanding gaps in veterinary curriculum on the topics of antimicrobial resistance and stewardship and developing antimicrobial, bleh, antimicrobial stewardship programs in veterinary clinical settings. Dr. Faze currently teaches undergraduate, graduate, and veterinary professionals about zoonotic diseases, antimicrobial resistance and stewardship, and infection control. Welcome, Dr. Faze. I will now turn the floor over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that warm welcome. And thank you to the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine for the opportunity to speak with you all today. So for today's talk, we're going to focus on... Um, learning about a little bit about antimicrobial stewardship and antimicrobial stewardship programs. Hopefully at the end of the, today's talk, you'll be able to explain how stewardship programs can be developed and implemented in a veterinary clinical setting and how antimicrobial stewardship programs and infection control programs work together in the fight against antimicrobial resistance. So I would be remiss if I did not talk a bit about antimicrobial resistance before di diving into stewardship. Resistance is one of the world's most urgent public health problems. Antimicrobial resistant organisms frequently and easily cross species boundaries, producing health problems in individuals from populations other than where the resistance emerged, which is why it's a global issue and why it's a one health issue as it impacts humans, animals, and the environment. There continues to be a lot of finger pointing, focusing on who's to blame for the issue of antimicrobial resistance, but this really misses the point because it's a multifactorial, multifactorial problem, as you can see on the infographic here. Um, things like overprescribing, um, lack of hygiene, poor sanitation, lack of new antibiotics developed, it's really not just one singular cause, and therefore it shouldn't be attributed to a single group. Our focus really needs to be shifting towards a one health solution and away from trying to figure out who's at fault. So we'll kind of look at why we care about resistance, um, starting with our human population. In humans, antimicrobial resistant infections can lead to increased mortality, longer hospital stays, prolonged recovery, and potentially even long-term disability. When first and second line therapies are ineffective due to resistant organisms, physicians are forced to use older, less effective drugs or drugs that will have more toxic side effects like colistin to treat their patients. These drugs are also more frequently expensive in addition to being less effective. So antimicrobial resistance is an urgent threat um, because it continues to impact more and more people with each passing year. In fact, a 2019 study on the global burden of bacterial antimicrobial resistance, not even including fungal resistant organisms, reported that the AMR bacterial infections were associated with nearly 5 million deaths in the year 2019. And so this is not something to be scoffed at. And you can see on this image here, um, and many of you may have seen this image before, that the number of deaths that can be attributed to antimicrobial resistance by 2015 are expected to reach 10 million. Factor that in with the fact that our current global pandemic has set us back um, in the fight against antimicrobial resistance, we might even see that number grow higher. So this has um, become an issue um, as far as uh, 
we have seen with the pandemic an increase in infections caused by organisms of concern, um, such as Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, um, vancomycin resistant Enterococcus. And we've seen antibiotics being prescribed to vi patients with viral disease, specifically COVID-19, even though the antibiotics are not effective against these viruses, um, almost 80% of patients hospitalized with COVID received an antibiotic from March to October, 2020. So we're seeing increased use, which is a driver of resistance. We're seeing an increase in recovery of resistant organisms. And then another complicating factor is that with this rise in resistance, we're not seeing an increase in production of new antimicrobials. According to a 2021 Pew study, there were only 43 new antimicrobial drugs in production, and of these, only 15 were, have the potential to treat um, WHO critical th threat classified pathogens, which include Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Acinetor bomini, um, and Carbapenemase producing Enterobacteraceae, so some of the ones we're seeing increase in numbers. So really what I'm here to say is this is a, not, a problem that's not going away anytime soon, and Though we've been highlighting this data in humans, we're going to switch now to animals because it does impact our veterinary patients as well. So similar to humans and animals, we can see a decrease in animal welfare due to ineffective treatment that leads to prolonged recovery, more negative side effects, and potentially even death. The other thing, though, that we have to factor our in with animals, though, is that there are some differences between our animal species and in humans, the first of which being that we're starting out with reduced therapeutic options in the first place. So we're limited um, in many species in the drugs that we have available to treat just routine infections. And then you add in resistant organisms, and that reduces the available treatment options even more. And so we have regulations for food safety and limitations due to labels. Um, so we can't use these drugs um, when we uh, are not able to kind of use our first line drugs in those populations. Additionally, um, we have economic impl implications. Now I am fully aware that at least in the United States, not everyone has insurance. And so um, we do see uh, money factor into therapy for humans. However, it's a little bit different on the animal side in that we do have production animal populations. So economic implications are um, due to lost income for our producers because of poor gains or poor production in our food producing animals or the requirement of early culling for sick animals to uh, reduce uh, de uh, decline in welfare. And on the companion animal side, so whether that be horses or dogs, cats, or exotic animals, um, we can have personal financial restrictions from owners. There's not a widely used third-party payer system. Um, and so therapeutic options can be limited. Owners may not be able to afford more expensive um, antimicrobial drugs and, and or they might not be able to pay for hospitalization for animals that are impacted more severely with these infections. And so this is a critical issue that we're facing. And as veterinarians, we need to expand our role in reducing resistance. And that's not to say that we haven't been participating in the fight already. Historically, um, we have been focused on prevention and control in veterinary medicine, which is a great thing. Um, antimicrobial drug use is a major driver of antimicrobial resistance, and that is both appropriate and inappropriate use. So we have really been focused on decreasing disease um, so that we decrease that need for antimicrobial drug use. We do this through good husbandry practices, promoting good infection control and biosecurity, incorporating the use of efficacious vaccines where appropriate. Um, and we've really been able to reduce the occurrence and spread of infectious diseases, but we don't completely eliminate them in our animal populations. And so now what we're starting to incorporate and consider is antimicrobial stewardship. So I always include this slide in any talk I give on antimicrobial stewardship, um, because I don't know about you all, but I certainly did not learn about it, um, at least not titled this way when I was in veterinary school um, a very long time ago. Um, but the definition of antimicrobial stewardship has been adapted by different organizations to address their specific needs. And I've included the AVMA um, 
description or definition here. But ultimately, regardless of what definition you look at, stewardship ultimately comes down to prescribing the correct antimicrobial drug at the correct dose for the correct duration, such that we increase the likelihood of a successful therapeutic outcome while minimizing the occurrence of negative side effects and the development of antimicrobial resistance. We then take this kind of concept or principles of stewardship and we shift to antimicrobial stewardship programs. And these are formalized hospital initiatives that incorporate the principles of stewardship and put them into action. So stewardship programs um, have been established in human health care for decades in the United States and even in veterinary medicine in countries such as the United Kingdom, Australia, and the Netherlands. Um, most programs, whether they are in human health care or veterinary uh, situations, include some element of antimicrobial drug use surveillance, the use of diagnostic testing and clinical microbiology, pharmaceutical expertise to, to guide clinical therapeutic decisions, um, infection control, and prescriber education. There is extensive literature that demonstrates the benefits to both patient care and healthcare facilities from antimicrobial stewardship programs. Hospitals that implement these comprehensive programs have demonstrated reductions in infections by multi-drug resistant organisms, reduced overall usage of antimicrobial drugs, reduced patient mortality, um, reduced patient length of stay, and ultimately because of this, reduced hospital operational costs. On the human healthcare side, there are several external drivers instituted at the federal level, at least here in the United States, that ensure that hospitals are incorporating stewardship programs into their facilities. Um, these include things like the National Action Plan for Combating Antibiotic Resistant Bacteria, which highlights the need to integrate these programs at all at levels of human healthcare delivery. Um, the requirement by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Service that facilities have an antimicrobial stewardship program with antibiotic use protocols and monitoring systems in place in order to receive funding. And also the Joint Commission requires facilities to have an antimicrobial stewardship pro uh, program that employs evidence-based practices and the involvement of an infection preventionist in order for hospital facilities to achieve accreditation. So Veterinary medicine in the United States has lagged behind human health care in implementing ASPs, and I think that part of the reason for that is due to the absence of those external drivers that I just mentioned in the previous slide, um, but it's also due to unique challenges that we face as veterinarians. So first of all, historically, there have been limited tools for support for developing antimicrobial stewardship programs in the veterinary setting. There has not been a model, um, though now there are. Historically, there have not been models for development of a program. Um, and even if there were, say, a singular model, veterinary medicine is a diverse field that has variable settings and multiple animal species, which makes it almost impossible for the universal adoption of a single program model that meets these needs. There have also been some limitations and training opportunities, at least in the past. Those have changed a bit, as I'll mention a bit later. Um, for veterinarians in antimicrobial stewardship, I've already mentioned, this was not something I learned about when I was at school, um, and many of my colleagues um, say the same. Additionally, we have a limited number of specialists. Um, we have uh, not as many infectious disease specialists or uh, veterinary clinically trained pharmacists outside of the tertiary referral setting. And so this can limit um, the uh, comfort level with developing and implementing these programs in the veterinary setting. We also have high costs associated with diagnostic testing. Again, that's not to say that they don't have those on the human side. Um, however, for those individuals that have insurance, that gets kind of absorbed and, and the cost gets buffered. So it doesn't um, seem as painful or as obvious. Um, whereas in the uh, veterinary side, these costs come directly out of our client and producer pockets um, because we really just don't have a consistent insurance or third-party payer system for animals. 
Additionally, we have limited data. Um, so when we do submit culture and susceptibility testing, um, we don't always have the same level of MIC data or minimum inhibitory concentration data for the various antimicrobial drug and animal species combinations that we would really need to inform our therapeutic decisions and guide them. Um, there are There's a lot of extrapolation that is required, um, and this is not as accurate as having that data um, and and this is definitely an area for more where more research is needed. Um, there's also kind of a barrier theme that we do share with human health care, um, and that is incorporating stewardship practices into an outpatient or primary care setting. Um, the reality of the outpatient setting is that it really does not lend itself to a simple transfer of an inpatient um, stewardship program model because these practices face different challenges to stewardship than those that we see in an inpatient setting. So clinicians in both human and veterinary healthcare um, experience different patient expectations, time pressures, um, they have different access to rapid diagnostic tests. Um, and in, in addition, on the, on the veterinary side, we don't have as many uh, rapid diagnostic tests available um, to guide our therapeutic decisions and ensure that we are prescribing antimicrobial drugs judiciously. Additionally, there are client pressures. Um, unpublished survey data collected from private practitioners in the state of Ohio um, demonstrated that private practitioners are interested in implementing stewardship practices and programs, but they really lack the time, money, and personnel, and they have concerns over fear of losing clients to other practices, um, the cost of culture and susceptibility testing, and that getting uh, passed on to their clients. Um, there have... Um, Again, mentioned the lack of education and expertise, um, and also um, current practice prescribing cultures. So um, for those that have been in a practice where um, antibiotics or antimicrobial drugs are prescribed um, freely, uh, there are client expectations and potentially even practice expectations that can make um, implementing these programs in practice more challenging. So the good news is the veterinary community in the United States has really recognized the gap um, and the need for stewardship in our hospital settings. And they've started to, we started to take steps to address it. Um, in 2017, the AVMA released its core principles of antibiotic stewardship, which you can see here on this slide. Um, and initially when these were released, they really urged veterinarians to take action um, to achieve these uh, principles, but they didn't really at the time provide guidance as to how to do this. More recently, though, they've released a veterinary checklist for antimicrobial stewardship that outlines actions that can be taken to address each of these listed principles. Now, when our team at OSU was developing our antimicrobial stewardship program, this document was not available. Um, therefore, we really relied heavily on what was being done on the human healthcare slide. And as I move through the next kind of section of the talk, I'll be discussing antimicrobial stewardship programs specifically, and many of these recommendations that the AVM has put out align with the work that we've been doing at OSU and the CDC recommendations for stewardship, which is really exciting um, to see. So as I just mentioned, when OSU CVM was developing our stewardship program, we did not have any veterinary models to guide the development. Therefore, we collaborated with the stewardship team at the OSU Wexner Medical Center and adapted the activities that they were doing in their hospital, along with CDC's core elements of hospital antibiotic stewardship programs to fit the needs of our hospital setting. And so I'm going to walk through these different elements, which you can see listed here on this slide, and how we're currently implementing them in the OSU Veterinary Medical Center, while also discussing how they can be incorporated into various types of other veterinary clinical settings. So not just academia or tertiary referral centers. And before I do that, I really want to be sure to emphasize that there's not a one size fits all formula for antimicrobial stewardship programs. And this is this rings true not just for veterinary medicine, but also in human health care, um, just like in human health care. Veterinary stewardship programs won't be identical because barriers and resources may be absent, amplified or altogether different in these various settings. However, regardless of the design of each antimicrobial stewardship program, actions taken and data gathered will lend insight to the promotion of judicious antimicrobial use practices. So we'll start out by looking at leadership commit commitment. For a stewardship program to be successful, 
hospital leadership needs to be on board and provide both financial and administrative support. So what does this look like in an academic or perhaps even a corporate setting? Um, well, that, that looks like program funding. Um, so in, uh, in our college, the Infectious Disease Signature Program provided funds um, to our working group, our stewardship working group, to help launch and maintain the program in our hospital. In addition to funds, it also requires that um, we get basically verbal and um, verbal support and um, and I, I say authority when I say authority, meaning that um, recommendations should be taken seriously and that the hospital administration really believes in the program and what we're doing. Um, so that um, having these champions of the program and sharing the message to the college um, highlights to faculty, staff, and students the importance of the activities taken and the need to incorporate stewardship act actions into their own day-to-day -day activities and practice. Now, in a clinical setting, so a private practice, this could look like um, a medical director or a practice owner leading the program themselves or designating someone on their team to be the champion of antimicrobial stewardship in the practice to both lead um, the development and implement implementation of the program. This really needs to be more than an edict, though. Um, these individuals need to be given time to develop and implement the program. They should be compensated for this time. And the expectation should not be that it's completed outside of regular business hours. Um, it could look like an administrative day or half day um, where that individual is not seeing appointments so they can focus their work on developing and implementing the program. It can also look like funding for that individual to attend continuing education that supports them in the process of developing the program um, or to fund travel to other institutions or other hospitals that have implemented programs um, to learn from them and bring what they learn back um, to uh, contribute to the development of their program. Um, Leadership should also provide that verbal support. Um, they should promote transparency by including the whole clinical care team and plans for the program. Um, there should be open discussion about expectations and goals of the program. Um, individuals should be empowered while doing their day-to-day -day operations to implement changes um, that align program goals. And um, overall, should always avoid um, shaming and blaming, which we'll talk about as we move into accountability. So commitment alone is really not enough for successful incorporation of antimicrobial stewardship into daily practice. Um, there really needs to be action and there needs to be leaders that are driving that action and the processes forward. So in our setting, this looks like um, having faculty, staff, and students actively participating in the program. Without this buy-in from all stakeholders, we'd never get off the ground. Um, so we have faculty leaders that play an active role in our program. We have a clinical microbiologist who provides guidance to clinicians when they're choosing um, the appropriate drug in difficult uh, antimicrobial resistant cases. Um, this individual also provides input on whether using a protected antimicrobial drug is important in certain situations. And I will circle back to what a protected antimicrobial drug is shortly. We have senior clinicians from each of the three um, areas of our hospital, companion animal, farm animal, and equine, that provide guidance to fellow clinicians regarding antimicrobial prescribing. And they also provide input on uh, best practices for our antimicrobial use guidelines. And finally, we have senior researchers in antimicrobial resistance, one of whom is an ACVPM member here, Dr. Armando Hoett, um, who also provide guidance on our surveillance activities, data analysis, um, biosecurity, and infection control. In a clinic setting, in a private practice, I did mention identifying a champion to lead the program. I think it would be even better if the program could be co-led by both a veterinarian and a member of the technical team. Um, champions uh, really can work together to engage other members of the care team in the program, as it really requires efforts from everyone to gain traction and become part of the practice culture. Um, engagement will come with clear expectations of everyone's role in the program, um, the acknowledgement and identification of barriers to program success, and ideally holding team brainstorming sessions on how these could potentially be overcome, and overall transparency on data that's collected um, and the impact of the program as it moves forward.
And as I said before, regardless of the setting, it's key to note that accountability does not equal blaming or shaming participants. Um, so this is not an opportunity for us to tell our coworkers how they're doing things wrong and how they're part of the problem. It's an opportunity for us to educate and gain buy-in to improve practices and increase awareness. So we really all can feel empowered in our role in reducing the development of antimicrobial resistance. So the next thing to consider is pharmacy expertise. And this is certainly something that's going to look different depending on the setting that you are in. So in a large academic institution or a tertiary referral center, you may have access to veterinary clinical pharmacists that can directly consult with clinicians. We're very fortunate here at OSU to have residency trained veterinary clinical pharmacists on staff. So these are individuals that go through um, pharmacy school, so the human healthcare pharmacy, and then they go through residency training specifically in veterinary clinical therapies, um, and they have extension, extensive knowledge about antimicrobial drugs and their appropriate use in clinical situ, um, situations, making them an excellent resource for both clinicians and students in our hospital. Um, they, our individual uh, pharmacists are also actively involved in the stewardship program. Um, they do monitor prescribing practices, and when they see a script for a protected antimicrobial drug, they consult with our clinical microbiologist to ensure that its use is necessary and that there's no other non-protected drug options that would be more appropriate um, for that particular case. Um, certainly in a general practice, uh, practice setting, um, area, area practitioners may be able to consult with these experts um, if they are aware that they exist, which I most certainly did not when I was out in practice. Um, but they are definitely available for consultation. However, um, for those individuals that are not aware of these experts um, or don't really have easy um, access for communication with them, there are other open source resources. Um, so we have our OSU antimicrobial use guidelines, which are available um, through a um, open source press books. Um, there is, was a recent app released by the University of Guelph, a first line app that um, has similar um, use guidelines information uh, that they have made available um, to um, anyone who is interested in utilizing it. Um, and there are also consensus-driven guidelines that are available that outline best practices for management of various infectious diseases in veterinary patients. So not having access to um, uh, board certified specialists or clinically trained pharmacists is not um, an excuse. There are definitely other options available to access pharmacy expertise. So we're going to move into action, and I think this is probably the section that I will spend the most time in. Um, actions incorporated in a clinical setting can look really different, as I've mentioned, based on individual setting priorities, needs, or resources. Um, but today I'm going to focus on review and feedback on antibiotic prescriptions, use guidelines, um, surveillance, and protected antimicrobials. And I'll start again with our setting, um, but also talk about some things that are being done at other institutions and what might be done in the prior primary care setting. So our uh, stewardship program at OSU has been fully functional in our veterinary medical center now for four years. This program, as I've said before, was adapted from the human health care model to address the specific needs of our tertiary referral veterinary hospital. Um, so components of our program include antimicrobial use guidelines. Um, these guidelines were designed to be used as a tool to promote the judicious use of antimicrobials in our veterinary medical center, and they were created by consulting current veterinary medical literature, while also incorporating the current practices in the OSU Veterinary Medical Center. Um, these are living documents as, uh, you know, information changes regarding best practices with antimicrobial drug use. Um, we're actually updating them currently and getting ready to release our own um, first line app uh, with this updated information. But this, um, these, uh, Use guidelines include drug information pages that have recommended drug doses, um, recommended durations where that information is available, um, both acceptable and unacceptable drug uses, and then classification status within our hospital. Um, we also include tables that serve as quick references for um, infections that list first and second line therapies for infections based on body site, based on species, also have list of um, common organisms 
germs that impact and cause infection in certain body systems. So really meant to be a tool to educate and guide judicious prescribing practices um, in our hospital and beyond. We also have an active environmental surveillance program. Um, this was initially uh, started at the very start of our program. We identified 165 sites throughout the three sections of our hospital where we sampled them monthly looking for key resistant organisms in our environment um, so that we could track their presence and um, identify uh, any areas um, maybe that needed some improvement in cleaning and disinfection or if there were um, updates that we needed to um, incorporate in how animals moved through our hospital. Um, but we have, uh, we wrote, we sampled the same sites for two years. And then after those two years actually began to rotate to other services, um, service areas in the hospital. And um, we are now such a part of the hospital culture uh, that when uh, faculty and staff see us in the hospital taking samples, they will actually come up to us and specifically request that we sample certain areas because they want to confirm um, that their cleaning and disinfection protocols are working. We also have a passive surveillance component um, to our program. We um we compile and uh, look at patient submission data to our clinical microbiology lab. We use um, this data to develop antibiograms that look at susceptibility patterns of organisms that are isolated from our patient population. And these antibiograms serve as a guide for therapeutic decisions um, for when our clinicians are awaiting culture and susceptibility results. Um, they can look at these to get a sense for uh, the common um, organisms that are impacted Impacting our patients and what those organisms tend to be susceptible to. Um, or if a client declines culture and susceptibility, clinicians can use these to guide empiric therapy. So there, even though it's empiric, it at least is some evidence-based um, decision-making um, and judicious use of those antimicrobial drugs. Finally, we also do review prescribing practices within the hospital. Um, so we do have... Um, we have historically captured and reviewed retrospectively um, prescribing practices. Uh, the goal has always been to do real-time evaluation of these practices, um, which has been restricted in the past because we did not have an electronic medical record system here. Um, we now do, um, but COVID <laughs> set us back a bit in our ability to um, switch over to real-time evaluation. So that's something that's still in development. However, um, one way one area where we do real-time evaluation is when we have requests for the use of critically important drugs that we have labeled as protected drugs within our hospital setting. And those drugs include vancomycin, piperacillin, tizabactam, linezolid, and the carbapenems. And the reason that we um, labeled these drugs as protected is because they are not used frequently in veterinary medicine, and therefore we don't have a lot of resistance to them in our patient population, and we would like to keep it that way. And so if a clinician um, requests to use these drugs, they put in a pharmacy request for this, um, they are required to consult with the clinical microbiologist or our clinical pharmacist um, to determine the appropriateness of that antimicrobial selection. And these drugs are not allowed to be used empirically in our hospital. They do require cultural susceptibility testing. Again, um, we are not forbidding their use. We are just trying to make sure that they're being used judiciously to maintain their efficacy in our population. So switching over to what some actions could look like in a private practice setting, um, you know, some of these are not necessarily going to look super different. So um, practices certainly can monitor prescribing practices within their hospital. Um, they can evaluate how individual actions um, uh, our individual prescribing is um, aligning with current literature and best practices um, that have been shown to reduce antimicrobial drug prescribing in veterinary and human health care. Um, in fact, our colleagues at the University of Minnesota have been working with private practices. They collect data um, from the um, from identified practices volunteering to volunteering their data, their prescribing information um, to get snapshots of um, how practitioners in the private practice setting are utilizing antimicrobial drugs. Um, they are also gathering that same data um, from other academic institutions. So, um, really trying to get a handle for what prescribing practices look like in the different. Um, the various veterinary settings. Um, 
practices I would encourage um, to have open discussions about how they're making their prescribing decisions. So this is something that doesn't even necessarily require um, data tracking, just discussing, you know, what goes into um, therapeutic decision making, making sure that clinicians are thinking critically about what organism might be causing a clinical presentation, whether that organism requires an antimicrobial therapy, and whether that therapy should be broad or narrow spectrum, systemic or localized, um, just really critically evaluating um, why we are practicing the way that we're practicing and not just relying on quote unquote, what has always been done. Um, they also can, uh, practices can evaluate how frequently diagnostic testing is being used to guide therapeutic decision-making um, rather than solely relying on empiric therapy. And then again, just continuing to compare their practices um, to that of the current veterinary literature recommendations um, will really go a long way in promoting judicious uh, prescribing in a practice setting. Practices can also use clinical microbiology data to direct their prescribing practices. Um, and so ideally, in a perfect world, culture and susceptibility testing would be used whenever a bacterial infection is suspected. However, that's not always feasible, particularly in an ambulatory or emergency setting, um, because we don't always have rapid diagnostics available. Um, or, or even developed for our patients. Um, if a patient is deteriorating, antimicrobial drug therapy may be needed to uh, may need to be initiated immediately. And so having an understanding of antimicrobial susceptibility patterns um, in uh, isolates from a particular patient population can be really helpful to guide empiric therapy. And so practitioners can actually consult with clinical microbiologists from their diagnostic laboratories to di direct development of practice-specific antibiograms. Um, if they're submitting enough culture and susceptibility tests, um, they can work with these, these experts on developing their own antibiograms that are specific for their patient population. But if they really don't submit enough to... Um, to get um, accurate data, they can also seek out regional antibiograms that detail the susceptibility patterns of microorganisms that are isolated from their practice area. So even though it's not specific to their practice, it's from their general area and it provides evidence-based guidance for empiric therapy when culture and susceptibility testing is declined or just um, not feasible um, or while waiting for culture susceptibility results to come back. Finally, um, we can take a page from our human healthcare um, colleagues in the antibiotic timeout. So an antibiotic timeout is a practice that involves reconsideration and possible adjustment of drug therapy based on culture results or patient clinical response where diagnostic testing is lacking. This practice ensures judicious use of antimicrobial drugs and often leads um, to a switch from a broad spectrum to a narrower spectrum antibiotic or antimicrobial. Um, and it also encourages submission of diagnostic testing in cases um, when a patient's condition is not improving. So it's just kind of a, another way um, to make sure that we are following up. We're not just prescribing um, and, and assuming um, that things are responding as we expect them to. And it can really help to convince owners um, or clients or producers that um, diagnostic testing is, is necessary if a patient is not responding appropriately to therapy. This is something I feel like a lot of us are already doing, um, but it, it's it, formalizing this process and making sure that it is implemented across the board in a practice would be would go a long way um, towards promoting stewardship and, and judicious practices where antimicrobials are concerned. So with that, we'll switch over to tracking, right? If we're going to do um, all of this work, uh, gather all of this data, it's really important that we monitor that data over time. And so really, um, it's important that that data that is collected is uh, that collected through stewardship activities is analyzed um, to identify trends and patterns that can inform practices um, within the setting moving forward. Um, information that's gathered over time can inform um, the program and identify strengths um, and areas for improvement. So um, opportunities for education, opportunities maybe for um, 
uh, evaluating data in different ways or collecting um, different information in active surveillance programs. Um, and I'll touch a little bit more on how this data can be used when I talk about stewardship and infection control together. But here, I just note that basically for all of the activities that we perform in practice, we do track the data. Um, and this is something that can be done in private practice as well. Um, certainly, we do this over long term. Um, Private practices may not necessarily have the resources to do that, but certainly um, you can look at snapshots. Um, you can look at you know small time periods and still um, you know look at um, trends that might again um, inform practices moving forward. Finally, um, as far as data is concerned, data also needs to be reported out to relevant stakeholders to keep them engaged in the program. Um, it's critical um, to demonstrate. Uh, why we are why are we are implementing these activities, why we have this program in place, um, and looking at the impact of the program on the practice setting. Um, so looking at reporting out prescribing practices. Um, so looking at, are there changes in those prescribing practices? Do we see increases or decreases in certain drug classes um, that might indicate or warrant um, necessary investigation? You know, why are we prescribing, um, you know, more drugs this year, more, more, drugs from this class this year than last year, um, really kind of trying to understand and, and look for opportunities to educate clinicians. Um, again, tracking with, uh, with antibiograms, um, looking at trends in susceptibility patterns. Are we seeing resistance develop in, um, against certain uh, drugs in uh, organisms isolated from patient populations? And then tracking environmental surveillance, um, you know, and analyzing that. Are we seeing any um, increase in the number of organisms of note recovered? Um, are we that might indicate the need um, for evaluation of um, biosecurity and infection control practices within the setting? And again, in a smaller practice setting, similar reports can be generated. Um, it's just important that um, individuals that are responsible for doing this are provided with it with the time within their normal work hours to accomplish it because it is really time consuming and they may also need additional training. I will say <laughs> I most certainly did when it came to antibiograms. I didn't even know what they were until I became involved in our stewardship program. And so it's really important that individuals that are um, in charge of kind of moving the program forward have time for training, have time for data um, compilation and analysis. And then kind of going along that line of education, um, it leads us to our last um, core element from the CDC for antibiotic stewardship programs, and that is education. For successful adoption of antimicrobial stewardship programs in the hospital setting, there really needs to be education of clinicians, staff, and clients. So in our setting, um, we have required training that our students do, um, both preclinical and clinical. I myself give uh, multiple lectures to them on stewardship. Um, we have a bugs and drugs uh, class taught by um, our clinical microbiologists, faculty, and our uh, veterinary clinical pharmacists to promote um, judicious prescribing practices. Um, we have training for faculty and staff. We meet with them routinely to um, discuss kind of the program and the data that we're getting back. Um, we also um, ask that our faculty and staff facilitate the student use of our antimicrobial use guidelines um, and provide appropriate feedback um, that aligns with those guidelines when they're looking at student treatment plans. So um, students know that they have that resource and we train them on how to use it as well. Um, and then we also are working to try and move um, that education component out into private practice through our Buckeye ASP certification program. Um, so this is a pilot program that we're running to try and address the challenges that veterinary clinics face in establishing a stewardship program um, in the clinical setting. We've partnered with practices in um, the Columbus area and we are guiding them through the development and implementation of their own stewardship programs. Um, we provide continuing education opportunities to practitioners and the staff in the hospital. Um, they have access um, for consultation with our clinical microbiologists and veterinary clinical pharmacists. Um, we work with them to create antimicrobial use guidelines that are tailored to the practice's patient population and general prescribing needs. Um, and ultimately the goal of this program is to provide practices with the initial resources needed 
um, to establish a program um, and the training and education required for it to be sustainable beyond the duration of the partnership. Um, so it's still in pilot um, the pilot program at this juncture. Um, COVID, uh, not surprisingly, has thrown a big wrench in it. Um, I'm sure most everyone on this call has experienced the impacts of COVID in some way, shape, or form. Um, but for us, it's really um, the time that practices have to devote to this, um, which is certainly a major challenge and one that we are trying to work with our partners to overcome. Um, looking at incorporating stewardship and private practice, certainly um, clinicians should seek out opportunities for continuing education in infectious disease, antimicrobial drug prescribing, and new diagnostic test availability, availability and capabilities. Um, also to reference the University of Minnesota again, um, they also have a continuing education um, seminar for practitioners um, that goes over how to develop a um, stewardship program within uh, their hospital setting. Um, so those are opportunities that are out there. Staff should re um, receive training as well, not only in antimicrobial stewardship, but also in communication as oftentimes um, they are the ones um, speaking with clients and having interactions with clients where antimicrobial therapy either is or is not being prescribed and being able to talk with clients about um, why they are or are not going um, home with an antibiotic for their pet um, or a producer for his herd, um, talking with them and educating them um, is really important. They need to be able to educate on the threat of antimicrobial resistance. Um, clients should also um, be able to understand how it can impact their animals themselves and their family. And this honest, open communication and education um, regarding antimicrobial drug practices really fosters trust and promotes client satisfaction um, which could reduce the likelihood that a client will find a new practice if they don't receive an antibiotic, which is one of those concerns that I noted earlier regarding stewardship and stewardship programs um, noted by some veterinary practitioners. So with that, I'm going to transition kind of into the last part of this talk, which is looking at um, stewardship and infection control. So really, antimicrobial stewardship and infection control go hand in hand. Um, as I mentioned earlier, antimicrobial drug use is the main driver of antimicrobial resistance, um, and it doesn't center solely on incorrect usage. Um, appropriate antimicrobial drug therapy can result in secondary infections um, with agents that may demonstrate resistance to traditional therapies. Um, therefore, it's really necessary for us to control infections in both the veterinary and human healthcare setting, um, in addition to promoting judicious antimicrobial use. Um, in fact, studies in human healthcare have shown that stewardship programs are more effective when a strong infection um, control practices, particularly hand hygiene, um, are in place. So, this is because good infection control practices help reduce the spread of disease and they reduce the need for that antimicrobial drug use. And what does this look like um, in any practice setting? Um, it looks like standard operating procedures that address methods of cleaning and disinfection, address patient movement through the hospital facilities or barns, um, address personal hygiene practices, potentially um, personal protective equipment, again, hand hygiene. Um, practices should really be devoting time to either creating or updating um, their infection control plans as needed, and then take the time to educate their staff on their existence and application. Um, the National Association of Public Health Veterinarians has a really great resource for developing infection control programs um, in hospitals. There are, there are even templates out there for these. Um, protocols can eventually then be integrated into stewardship programs, um, and stewardship programs can then inform infection control practices. So we talked talked about um, the incorporation of surveillance, environmental surveillance and surveillance of patient isolates. Um, information gathered from this can really help to inform um, cleaning and disinfection practices and identify areas for improvement and increased provider education. And we experienced that here in our own hospital from our environmental surveillance data. Um, I've just concluded a little snapshot here. So this is a picture of one of our team members um, sampling. Uh, basically, we go through in Swiffer. We glorify dust the hospital to gain our samples. Um, but what we were recovering early on in our program where we were seeing um, organisms that would typically be found on our patients um, on human touch surfaces, such as our touch screen monitors, our laptop, um, our computer keyboards and mice. Certainly our patients are not going around and operating our computer systems. So what that told us was that 
that there was an, um, a need for some increase in education around hand hygiene in our hospital. And so that led us to uh, develop and launch a hand hygiene campaign. Um, we created a hand hygiene video um, that uh, went over appropriate times and methods for hand hygiene. Um, we created signage that to this day is still posted in our hospital. It's absolutely beautiful. And I've included one of the signs here um, that really just highlights when hand hygiene should be be performed. And we were even uh, working on a um, a separate surveillance uh, program to evaluate the impact of this uh, hand hygiene campaign on practices within our hospital. Um, and then COVID came and we had to halt all surveillance activities. Um, and unfortunately, uh, once we, we lost that, uh, we could not get that uh, data back. So thanks COVID for that. Um, additionally, we uh, were able to utilize surveillance data to inform our cleaning and disinfection protocols. Um, and also uh, transportation. So you can see here, I've included a little snapshot of one of our standard operating procedures that we updated uh, based on data that we were getting back from our surveillance to improve the movement of individuals with known or suspected infectious disease through our hospital. Um, so these are things that can also be incorporated, you know, in any practice setting. Um, and it doesn't have to be, you know, surveillance done every month. Um, you know, there can be quarterly surveillance, um, biannual, um, really just kind of trying to look for trends and, and what those trends might be telling us about activities within the hospital um, can really help to promote infection control and therefore support um, antimicrobial stewardship. So finally, um, you know, I've talked a lot about um, a well-resourced institution or practices that maybe can implement a comprehensive program. Um, and many of you may be thinking, well, is it all or nothing? You know, what if I, I work in a practice or I know of a practice that, you know, might be able to do one, one of these, but not all of them. Um, I, I think that there is room for stepwise implementation of these program components. And that really um, was highlighted in a partnership that we have with a school um, in Costa Rica um, who contacted us because they were looking for um, a specific, they had specific needs for stewardship and infection control in their hospital. And they came to us because they wanted to um, they wanted to reduce the risk of nosocomial infections in their equine patient population specifically. Um, and so faculty, staff, and students from our institution collaborated with our colleagues at their institution to develop an environmental surveillance program to gather data and identify if their current cleaning and disinfection protocols were effective. And things have been going very well with that. And we have created a strategic plan um, for growth and sustainability of the stewardship program at their facility when additional resources are identified and support for that program goes. And so really the key, um, if you are going to implement a stepwise or singular um, kind of components of these programs is to identify what your priorities are um, based on your available resources, um, the specific goals or interests that you have within your setting. And also your needs for um, to support your patient health and safety. In this way, it'll allow you to utilize whatever resources are available, be that time, personnel, or money, um, to be utilized most effectively. Because ultimately, um, any practice that has the opportunity to incorporate stewardship practices, whether that be individually or as an organized comprehensive program, um, either way, they're going to be promoting judicious antimicrobial drug use, and that contributes to the fight against antimicrobial resistance and the protection of both animal and public health. So with that, as only a few seconds over. Um, I'd like to take a quick moment to thank um, the, my colleagues in the Antimicrobial Stewardship Working Group, um, the Ohio State University College of Veterinary Medicine, and our Infectious Disease Institute and Infectious Disease Signature Program um, for their continued support of the stewardship program in our college. And with that, I'm going to take a bit of water and a breather, and then happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Um, the first one, you mentioned uh, uh, the lack of a veterinary model on antimicrobial stewardship. Um, do you have any thoughts or, or comments on, is, is that a uh, U.S. unique uh, problem or is it a, more an international uh, problem? Um, I think that for a comprehensive program, at least when we started, um, there really wasn't published data on 
comprehensive programs. I think there are a lot more resources available now, as I said, um, you know, University of Minnesota has great resources available on their website. Um, we actually published a commentary in JAPMA in 2020 that outlines um, in much greater detail um, our program here at OSU. Um, and so um, resources like that and then resources um, through the AVMA uh, are certainly available um, on the in, an open resource, you know, on the on the Internet. Um, so I think that certainly, you know, every every region, every country um, is going to have their own challenges as far as what resources are available. Um, our model, though comprehensive and the models that are available don't necessarily, um, you know, there's there's a wealth of, of, of other activities or actions that can be taken. And I, I think a lot can still be pulled from the human health care side. Um, so it's, it's certainly um, getting better as we are becoming more aware of this. And, um, you know, we're, like I said, we're working currently with a program in Costa Rica and um, eventually plan to, um, you know, re release reports from that and, and hopefully publish um, information um, from that experience and, and um, what, what can be done in settings where maybe there are not resources um, as readily available. Uh, great. Uh, this next one, uh, for your softball is the is the Ohio State Pharmacy Guideline available online? It is, and I would be happy, um, Dr. Toring, to send that to you, um, okay. and and uh, that can be shared, so I'll make a note to do that. Okay. What I'll do is, if you send it to me, I will just attach it to uh, um, email that I send out with the CE certificates. Does yeah. that sound reasonable? Yes. Okay, great. Another question, you know, are you aware of any work that's been done with uh, uh, antibiotic, antimicrobial stewardship <laughs> within animal control, shelter, community? Um, yes. Um, so we have not focused our program on that, but I know um, that Dr. Jeanette O'Quinn um, in our facility um, also has um, been kind of working on expanding that. I can't say that I know any specifics, but certainly I could, she is our resident expert in shelter medicine. Um, I can reach out to her and kind of see if she is aware of any um, specific uh, projects or programs that are going on. That's a area that we would like to expand our program into. Um, but again, um, the, uh, COVID pandemic has really, <laughs> has really thrown a, a wrench in some of our, our plans for that, for really expansion of our program just in general. Um, but that's definitely an area where there is some great need um, due to, um, you know, kind of the infectious diseases that um, can impact large populations like in a shelter setting. Excellent. Uh, we'll do one more question. Um, first of all, a compliment. The presentation is great. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences. Can you tell us a little bit more about your work in creating antibiograms? Did you create separate antibiograms by species, uh, by small, large okay. animal, et cetera? Yes. So um, fun fact about antibiograms, they are so much more complex than I ever thought that they were. Um, they can be a bit of a headache because of um, the limited MIC data that we do have on the veterinary side. Um, but I work very well. I don't do them anymore, um, which is a slight relief, but I worked very closely with our clinical microbiologist in creation of them. Um, we created them by um, species. Um, so we had one for dogs, cats, horses. Um, and then unfortunately, uh, we really don't have enough submissions from our um, large animal, our production animal uh, patients to have um, accurate uh, data. So you you need a minimum of 30 um, isolates uh, to really have um, data that, that you can utilize to guide therapeutic decisions accurately. And we just didn't have that. So um, we actually are trying to um, gather more data uh, from our um, uh, local diagnostic lab, our Ohio um, Department of Agriculture uh, Diagnostic Lab to get some more information for those. Um, but we uh, go through the patient submission data um, and we have, um, we look for key organisms and then track their susceptibility um, in our uh, clinical microbiology um, 
report, like our electronic, like that record system. Um, so it is a lot of consultation of CLSI guidance um, regarding uh, the minimum inhibitory concentrations and, you know, what, where is the cutoff for um, resistant and susceptible. And it is a lot of me working with um, the clinical microbiologist. And that's why I say kind of in a local setting. Um, so if you uh, are working in a private practice and you submit a lot to say IDEX or ANTEC, uh, potentially reading, reaching out to their clinical microbiologist and talking about generating um, an antibiogram from um, the data submitted from your hospital. But I don't see any additional questions. So I will turn it back over to Dr. Pettit from the Continuing Education Committee. Again, I thank everybody for their attendance uh, um, and look for those CE certificates in about a week to 10 days. Dr. Pettit. Thank you, Dr. Face, for the uh, excellent presentation and thank you everyone else for attending today. Uh, just as a reminder, we are always looking for speakers for our monthly CE webinars. If anyone is an interested or knows any someone who would be interested, please contact the CE committee with uh, via email or via the ACVPM webpage by submitting a request for a speaker or a topic. Uh, again, thank you very much to Dr. Faze and all who attended this webinar. And, and I'll just make one last comment. Our next webinar is scheduled for the 1st of December. I have not sent out the announcement on that. I plan to do so tomorrow. So keep an eye out for... Uh, for future webinars. Uh, 1 December will be the date for that 